Welcome everyone, my name is Bogomil Kamiński and today I will present you the next part of the Georgia uh, Academy tutorial on data frames JL. In this part of the tutorial I will show you how you can easily use a data frame as a storage for a result of some experiments uh, that you are doing computing on. For this uh, part of the tutorial, we will not introduce any new packages. We, will, we use data frames package uh, for data frames, uh, statistics for statistical functions. We will use PyPlot for plotting. Random is a module from Julia Base that allows you to work with random number generators and pipe for uh, simple piping of operations on uh, different, uh, combining different functions. So uh, what we will run here is a very simple Monte Carlo simulation and uh, I will show you how you collect the results of such a simulation in a data frame. So uh, for this um, I want to present you some famous uh, puzzle. Uh, so assume that we are drawing in numbers from uniform distribution over zero to one interval and we are adding them. And the question is how many draws do I need to make till the co cumulative sum of these numbers exceeds one. So I get some numbers, for example, I have drawn 1.3 0.3, so I continue. Next, I draw like 0.4, so their sum is 0.7, it's below one, so I continue. Then I draw, for example, half, so a sum is 1.2, so I exceeded one, so uh, the number of draws needed in this case was uh, three. Uh, and the question is, what uh, is the expected, expected value of the number of draws that have to be made. So uh, let me start with a simple code that implements uh, this simulation. Uh, so I create a draw vector uh, mm, which will contain float 64 values and now I draw a random number uh, as you can see here and I add it to the end of our draw vector and if the sum of this draw vector exceeds one then I return this vector. So as a result of sim e function I get a vector of draws that has such a property that its sum is greater than one. As noted in the comment above uh, this is not the most efficient way to, uh, to run this simulation, but uh, I leave uh, improving the performance of the code as an exercise and still this code is fast enough for our purposes. So uh, in order to have our uh, experiment repro reproducible, Assuming you are using the same version of Julia that I am, I set a seed of random number generator uh, so that when you run this notebook, you get the same result. The results, sorry. So, for example, I create a res vector that contains five results of our simulation. Uh, so we can see that in all cases, if we checked it, uh, which we do here below, the, the sum of values exceeds one, but if I remove the last value from each vector, so I subtract the last value, then we can see that the sum is below one. So indeed, we have checked that our function works correctly. The returned vectors have the, mm, such a number of elements that I have just exceeded one in our random number generation process. So now let us see how simple it is to, to collect the result of this simulation in a data frame. So I create an empty data frame. As you can see here, 
And what I do, I do uh, 10 million times uh, our experiment and just push a named tuple containing uh, experiment number in ID column and the experiment result in a post uh, column. And uh, you can see here that I have benchmarked it. It takes around 10 seconds to run this. And we can see that uh, indeed we got a data frame with 10 million rows and two columns, ID and uh, post column, which has those random numbers randomly drawn uh, in such a way that they exceed one. So uh, the nice thing here, we have al already talked about it, but you can see that I can easily store any type of data in columns of the data frame. In this case, again, those are vectors. Uh, so, uh, and it is important because if you are doing a simulation, you might have very different types of data that you collect from a simulation. So here, data frames doesn't put any limitations or on what you can store. So now, uh, let us add a new column to this data frame. This new column uh, will be number of jumps that were needed to be used. So there are many ways I could have created this column, but let us use a transform bank function just to exercise the uh, style of creation of the columns in the data frame that we have discussed earlier. So I take a post column, I take a length of uh, the vectors contained in it. By rows, by row tells me that length should be applied to each element of post column. And jumps is the name of the output column. So I can see here that here is the number of jumps I needed to do in order to exceed one. And we can see here visually that everything worked as expected. Uh, so now the point of our uh, exercise is to calculate the mean of jumps. So we were interested in the num expected number of jumps and we can see that this mean number of jumps is around uh, 2.71. And similarly, we could have used, again, this time the combine function because we want to combine rows. I want to calculate the mean of jumps column uh, without any grouping because in the last lecture we shown, have shown how to calculate aggregates by group. But if we are not grouping by anything, simply the whole data frame is considered as one group. And we can see here that I get then a data frame just with one row containing the same mean as was produced above. Now, the interesting thing is that if you can notice that this value is very, very close to the mass constant of Euler's E. So actually, this is not a coincidence. You can show that this is exactly the case. Uh, and but before we discuss it, uh, let us find out what is the distribution of number of jumps required to exceed uh, one. So as you can see here, that this we calculate this distribution in the following way: I take a data frame, I group it by jumps and sort the groups because we have seen again in the previous lecture by, that by default the groups are ordered in the order of appearance. But we, here we want to sort them, so I want the jumps sorted from one increasing. And then uh, in the uh, previous uh, presentation, I have shown you that you can calculate the number of rows just by passing n row function, but equally well, you can pass a, a custom a function. So for example, if I pass length, I exactly get the same because I'm getting the length of the jumps vector, which is essentially the number of rows that a given group 
spans. So here we can see a very interesting thing. That number of jumps uh, is uh, actually uh, forming some pattern. Let us check uh, what uh, uh, what this uh, what this uh, pattern is, uh, and uh, here is uh, the calculation. So we take the jumps aggregate uh, function. We uh, have this jumps length, so the number of elements, number of rows that had this given number of uh, jumps. And now what I do, uh, first of all, again, to exercise some more complex transformation, I'm uh, here calculating the percentage of rows that uh, had this number of uh, jumps. Uh, and uh, here I put some theoretical value that is defined as x minus 1 divided by factorial of x. And we can see here that I actually have guessed right what is the formula for the theoretical uh, value uh, of, the, uh, of the numbers obtained by the simulation. And I will not go into uh, the derivation in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, um, in this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, you can look it up uh, in the internet because it's quite a famous puzzle. But just let me briefly show that indeed, if this is the proper formula for prob probability that t, that first of all the probabilities add up to one, and then the expect that the expected value is indeed the Euler's constant. Uh, so now maybe just one note that the easiest way to justify the sequence p n of those probabilities is uh, to observe that one minus a sum of pn from, for n from 2 to k is 1 over factorial of k. Uh, but uh, let us uh, move on uh, to another thing that is interesting and also you might want to uh, think about the justification for it. So, <coughs> Uh, let us uh, let us do the following. So I want from each vector this number of jumps select its its first and last element. So uh, from post vector I select its first element. So those first elements will be here 6 0.64, 0.65, and so on and their last elements. Uh, so you can see that I quite easily can extract such information from our data frame and I get another data frame with just two columns, first and last. And now I want to see a histogram of those both columns. So the histogram of the first column is a it has a uniform distribution. And this is something that I would have normally expected. I have drawn the numbers uh, from a uniform distribution, so they are following this distribution. But note that if I'm looking at the last element in each vector here, the last element, there is a surprise. Although I have used rand function to draw them, uh, the distrib their distribution is not uniform. Actually, I can see that I much more, much more often get large values than low values. Uh, so is this something uh, about rand function being broken <laughs> in uh, Julia base? Again, I will skip the derivation, but the short justification for this fact is the following. If I draw 
random numbers and I stop my process uh, when I exceed one, this means that the last value I have drawn is more likely to be large. Why? Because conditionally, I, I know that this is last, so uh, I have additional information that drawing this number led me to stop that uh, drawing process. So if this number was very small, it would be much less likely that the process stopped than when the number is very large. So this is uh, a short presentation how you can use data frames to collect data and later process data from experiments. And this is something that is uh, very frequently used in practice. Uh, so I hope that you enjoyed it and maybe some of you will get interested in the mathematical part of the problem I described and uh, dig into the derivations of the formulas that I have shown. So thank you for, very much for participating in, in this part of the tutorial and I invite you to check out the last part uh, next. Thank you.